Hello there, it's James B. Welcome to my podcast. Once again, uh, I have a very special guest. Every week, every Friday, I'll talk to somebody for a while, uh, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour. And Molly Johnson is somebody with a lot to say. Uh, she's picked up an Order of Canada, a Juno, lots of awards. But more importantly, she's really community-minded. Uh, she's an amazing singer-songwriter, and we're going to get to her in about eight minutes. Uh, so, Molly Johnson coming up. Right now, I want to thank uh, some of my sponsors, Barbarian's Steakhouse. Mm-mm. In fact, I'm going to be speaking with Molly Johnson at Barbarian Steakhouse coming right up because uh, I want to take her out for lunch first and then we'll go upstairs and have a quiet chat. Uh, so thank you Barbarians. Check it out. 7 Elm Street. Amazing food. Uh, especially if you like rack of lamb or a nice steak. Me, I like the seafood, but they have everything there. Uh, BarberFinancial.com. Captain Paul Barber, an old friend of mine. BarberFinancial.com. Uh, they do things big and small. If you're an independent person looking after your money, trying to figure out what to do, he'll help you. If you have a huge company and you need help, he won't hold that against you. He'll help you there too. Uh, Patreon. Oh, I love Patreon. Patreon collects money and gives it out to people. And if you go to Patreon, up there. Uh, you can donate $5 a month, $10 a month. It makes a big difference to me. And thank you to those people who do that. Anyone who donates to Patreon, I'm inviting them to some private events and some special parties because you're putting your money where your heart is. You're helping me support jazz and the arts. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Beeline Music Adventure Tours. I'm my own sponsor. Uh, JamesB.ca is where you can get information about that. If you want to go on a music related trip somewhere, in the world I will take you and your friends or come by yourself and meet new friends it's all good jamesb.ca for that now let's go right into Old Mill Toronto I'm going into now some of the clubs who support this podcast and who book amazing music um, for a good example tonight one of my best friends Genevieve Marantet is singing at Old Mill Toronto Homesmith Bar tonight Eric St. Laurent will be on guitar um, uh, Robert Scott on piano, and these guys are fearless. It's going to be an amazing show. Get there early. The show's at 7.30, but if you want to get a seat, you might want to sit down by 6.30 or 7 o'clock, order up some food, and enjoy an amazing evening. Now, every show at Old Mill Homesmith Bar is a $20 minimum, no cover, 7.30 to 10.30 every show. And coming up next week, uh, here are some band leaders, John McLeod, Cal Dodd, Steve Amaro, uh, Neil Swainson. They're all leading bands playing at this place. So I know you're going to love it. Just go there and thank me later. OldMillToronto.com. Click on Homesmith Bar. Lula Lounge. I'm always talking about Havana Club Fridays and Salsa Saturdays. Well, there's also something pretty crazy coming up on Sunday. Oh my God, I love this. It's a 12 noon drag queen brunch. Lula's Drag Brunch Extravaganza. $45 gets you a full buffet brunch and a show, or just $15 if you want the show only. If you want the show only, you might want to have uh, uh, some uh, uh, mimosas. I call it mimosa sans orange. That's mimosa with no orange, just champagne. Yeah, you probably like that too. But anyway, it's hilarious. Um, I think it's going to be very clean and very friendly and very sweet. One time I went to a, uh, a burlesque brunch and I actually complained to my waiter because there wasn't a hair in my soup. But anyway, we won't go there. Um, it's really cool. There's also Spectacle Cabaret this week on two nights, a Valentine's Day concert, so much stuff to do. Go to lula.ca for more information on that. And now over to Jazz Bistro, Colin Hunter, my old buddy, he's playing there with the Joe Seeley Quartet, an amazing band. And if you like crooners, Colin Hunter just keeps getting better. And it's a wonderful show. I love going there on weekends to see local tourists amazed by uh, the food, the music, and the ambiance. Uh, I should mention there's a lot of stuff happening there. Robert Scott's playing there, playing piano every night before people go to the Mervish Theatre shows or, or uh, whatever's going around the Young Dundas Square area. People love to go there for dinner. Robert Scott will look after you with his phantom fingers. Um, and Alex Samaras and J uh, John Alcorn, two of my favorite gorgeous romantic male singers. They are just 
beautiful inside and out, and they will get you all goosebumpy. So they're playing a Valentine's Day show. Uh, jazzbistro.ca for all that stuff. Now over to Hughes Room Live. Uh, Hughes Room Live has John McDermott today and tomorrow with friends uh, performing, wonderful singer, and then Sunday, a tribute to Carol King, who doesn't love her music. That's a great idea. They do a lot of these tributes at Hughes Room, and it's extremely popular. So go to their website, get your tickets in advance to make sure you can get in. Um, on Monday, Tim Booth's Toronto Art Orchestra. Now, if I can free myself up for Monday, I am absolutely going to be there. Um, Colleen Allen, Bruce Cassidy, John McLeod, some really heavy hitters are performing. Tanya Willis and uh, Jessica Lalonde are going to be singing with this ensemble. And they're doing music from uh, Bob Brookmeyer and Maria Schneider. So these are going to be heavy charts and thick music and amazing music. Um, you want to check that out on the Monday. And all the stuff that happens there is at HughesRoomLive.com. If you feel so inclined, I'm playing there on March 5th with the Tiki Collective. We're doing a whole bunch of new music. And uh, if you've seen the band before, get ready, fasten your seatbelts. There's some new stuff uh, coming down the pike. TheRex.ca, what's happening there tonight? Baritone saxophonist Claire Daly. She's up from New York. She's got Adrian Ferrugia on piano, uh, Mike Juno winning Downs on the bass, Ernesto Cervini on drums, and Sophia Perlman on vocals. That should be really fun. Uh, and tomorrow night, more Sophia Perlman, I'm assuming, the Vipers are playing. Howard and his gang. Howard Moore is a great trumpet player, band leader, and uh, Sophia is usually with them. I'm assuming she will be. But no matter what, that is a killer band. They're really good. They play some bebop and some swing, and you will love them. And on Sunday, one of my favorite bands at 9.30 at the Rex Hotel, Jay Danley's Ethio Jazz Band. If you like Mulatu Estadke, if you like 60s Ethiopian groovy music, if you like the movie Broken Flowers with Bill Murray, you know what music I mean? It's 60s, it's groovy, it's Ethiopian, and it's at the Rex on Sunday night at 9.30. So it's really, really cool. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, Sting is in town. That's crazy. Sting is here, and he's doing a musical called The Last Ship. God bless David Mervish. Uh, Mervish.ca for the information on that. In my opinion, I liked, I liked The Police when they came out. That was just, I was a kid, they were my favorite band. Um, and I continued to follow his career, but I have this theory that maybe after a while, he had sung so many songs about his life, his observations. I think he's having the time of his life right now, singing songs from somebody with a different personality, with a different, he's writing for characters in a musical. So the kind of music he's writing, you'll be amazed. I think it's some of the best work he's ever done in his whole life. So uh, if you want to see this, I've only heard the musical. I've never seen it yet. I've only heard the soundtrack. Can't wait. Mervish.ca to get tickets to this show. And speaking of Mervish, David Mervish, love him. Ed Mervish, his dad, what would Toronto be without Ed Mervish? I'm going to talk to uh, Mo Molly Johnson right now, and I believe Ed Mervish discovered Molly Johnson when she was about four years old and put her in Porgy and Bess, put her in Finian's Rainbow, where she met Don Franks, um, all kinds of stuff. So we're going to go to Barbarian Steakhouse. We're going to talk to the great Molly Johnson, and uh, here we go. Oh, may I? I'm, I'm cheersing you with an empty glass. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I have an empty head. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I congratulations. Uh, meaning to tell you, yeah, you're up for a Juno, and I think this is the first time you've been on this category. I can't remember where the Infidels were. That must My have been a rock, rock that independent rock band or rock band. Yeah, this this might be a new category for sure. So it's is it adult contemporary? That's what they call it, AC. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Larry Klein. Oh my gosh, so, Mensch. I know that you have made so many records, I have all of them, but <laughs> the one with Larry Klein, I mean, that's that's a real producer. How did that come about? Well, um, a friend of I don't mean they're not real producers, the no, other No, 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 we yeah. always produced ourselves, yeah. and uh, or had Steve McKinnon, the writer of many of my songs, mm -hmm. produce stuff, but mm -hmm. Mike Downs, like we all kind of just produced ourselves, and I'm a super lazy singer, so I would do a couple of takes and go home <laughs> and let those guys mix it like i i don't really care <laughs> yeah you know that's the best i was that day at that moment 
work with it. <laughs> right, right. It's like, you want me to do it again? I'll just do it the same. I'll or I'll do work. it another fantastic way, and then you'll have to choose. I'm out of here. <laughs> so working with Larry uh, came about from a friend of mine in Nashville who sent him a song, a demo, that Davide Dorenzo, the great drummer, and I had written called Protest Song, a lullaby for your protest march. So we'd written this thing uh, and uh, sent it to Larry, and he sent a note back saying, I've been hearing about you for years. Where have you been? So this is the guy that produced, well, Tracy Chapman, Joni Mitchell, Melody Gardot, uh -huh. Madeline Perot, like Nora really Jones. the divas of all the, the, yeah, the best like singers. The great yeah. singers. He's a great singer guy, and he said, "Where have you been all these years? I've been hearing about you in France. Where have you been?" And I said, "I was. I've been at home raising my kids. I've been at home making." peanut butter sandwiches and doing the laundry. Where do you think I've been? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Children. Yeah. And he loved that because he had just had a baby. Mm -hmm. So his first and only baby, and he's in his late 60s. So he had his miracle oops baby. So if I'd said to him I was at home raising my kids 10 years ago, he wouldn't have had a clue of what I was saying. But being a dad himself yeah. changed everything. And he went, oh, and in fact, a couple of times when I was in Los Angeles working with him, he actually had to blow me off because he had to take his kid to Disney World and stuff. And if you're going to blow me off for any reason at all, please be about your children. And I just loved him more for that. Yeah. So having him come to Toronto uh, and work with what I like to call the supergroup of Canada, you're talking Robbie Botosh, Justin Abedin, Mike Downs, and Davide Dorenzo. I mean, you couldn't get... Yeah. a better bunch of guys in a room and then to bring Larry in to give us all an incredible master class it was a master class in making a record we recorded in five days and uh, it was superb there's something he brings um, it, it's it's a way he does things, right? right? Like he brings in yeah. the way. This is the way I want to prepare your band for this music right. to make it important and to maybe even challenge people that Absolutely. are already so good. Yeah. But he has a new way of. I've, I've heard this from other people. We brought him to Kensington Market first, and we did a little rehearsal in one of the clubs there for him, and we just hung around with him that day and ran the tunes and talked about the tunes and had lunch and talked about the tunes and then next day we basically went into the studio and started recording in downtown Toronto and five days ten songs um, super fantastic and then Universal uh, who've been so very good to me I'm just I've been a Universal artist for over a decade um, in fact I was told I was a legacy artist and I said oh what does that mean <laughs> with my white platinum hair. What does that mean exactly, Jeff? You're seven years old. What does that mean, president of my record company? And he thought about it for a minute and he said, I think it means that you've outlived all the assholes. And I went, yeah, I have. Thank you very much. Yep. I'm happy to be a legacy artist because I have, I have outlived all the assholes. Yeah. Um, and then they proceeded to support this record in unbelievable ways. Like, there's one thing about government funding for an album, which we were able to, of course, tap into, but Larry Klein does not fall under any Canadian banners. Right. So you Larry's pay him. fees, Larry's travel, Larry's hotels, uh, his engineer, his engineer's fees, his engineer's hotels, Molly, that's me, mm. getting to go to Los Angeles not once but twice to hang out with Larry, all paid for by, as we at Universal call, Bieber money. Bieber money is real, actual dollars. That's right. It's money that they made from selling something called music. Yeah, <laughs> right? Right. So awesome to get that kind of support from them. And it hasn't stopped. The record's been out a while, and I still have a publicist from Universal, a very good one. Um, I, I'm... Uh, still very much the music supported. videos that are yeah, just so YouTube's. tasteful. Thank they're you. they're really tasteful. Thank you. That's yeah. from, you know, getting to have a teeny tiny budget for a YouTube video. I think we Canadian artists are well versed to right. take this on because I remember back in the days of Much Music where we'd make a video and we'd think, oh my goodness, thirty five thousand dollars. This is incredible. And then you realize. You're up against Madonna's half a million dollar video, and you're That's like, right. oh, we better get creative with this. We better get smart about this. Yeah. And it made us smarter 
and cr super creative artists in terms of visuals because we just didn't have the same budgets even with the incredible support from Factor and others yeah. we still you're not going to match a Madonna video budget right or uh, you know whatever yeah David Bowie everybody everybody, everybody had everybody, huge everybody, budgets everybody. back then and we yeah. little Canadian bands were thrown into that mix and had to come up with at much music 3% of the world market that's all we got in That's Canada. And it. we're the size of, like, it's like someone from Australia touring. So it says, well, you know, it's you really know, hard to people tour often here. People say to me, why don't you play in Vancouver? And I say, well, I can fly my band to France, cheaper than Vancouver. And when we get to France, there are 48 million people there. Right. And you're treated like a star in France. They you love, and Jerry Lewis. Yeah, they love And Kelly me. Lee Evans. There's a handful of you out there. They do, uh, they do love it. They do love artists, for sure. But, but the notion that you can fit France into Ontario twice, and they have double the population. Yeah. Um, and you get out to Vancouver, and there's maybe one show. And then you're flying back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we go to France a lot. It's yeah, it's a hard it's a hard thing being a Canadian musician. It is. And, and I just always touring say, here. And I always say, um, Canadians as a whole, we love culture. Like we really do. We are a culture loving, comedy loving, music loving, art loving country of people. We're just very diverse. So we have different interests. There's not very many of us. And we're spread over a magnificent, huge piece of geography. Yep. So this is what we're up against. It's not that Canadians don't show up. Mm -hmm. It's not that they don't love it mm -hmm. and want to be a part of culture and proud of our Canadian culture. There's just not, there, it's just hard you know, to do. Which is mm -hmm. why immigration in Canada is, is critical and very important part of of our, our governance. Right. Now, you, I, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff. We're going to go back to your old stuff because when you say that, Kensington Market yeah. is the microcosm of Canada. It is, the, it is what Canada Absolutely. is about. Absolutely. Your love of the market is, is really well known, but especially the Kensington Market Jazz Festival. You're yes. going into your fourth year. Our fourth year. Nobody died. It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that you your mantra was, and no one has done a festival like this that I've ever heard of, Everyone buys a ticket at the door. You don't get tickets in advance. If you can't get into the show you want, there's another good one next door. That's right. What a bizarre idea. Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. That's not exactly cookie cutter. Yeah, you know, cash only is the way we roll at Kensington. Um, well, first of all, I simply didn't have the administration. I didn't have the office amount of people in an office to be writing checks and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I thought, you know, when I play Massey Hall, for instance, I'm playing for the door. There are four big red doors at Massey Hall, and it's ten grand just to get in the room. Right. Never mind, put stuff on that stage. Yep. So it's ten grand. So I'm playing for the door, and I, I feel that we've lost as artists, we've lost our mojo around playing for the door, and we've gotten lazy. And what we need to do is work on social media and promote and stuff the event. Right. Back in my old days, yep. I made my own posters. I put them up on the poles. I spray painted my band name everywhere I could. Like, like you, you, you have to market yourself, and maybe that's a silly word, market, but you need to promote yourself. Yeah. And I think that artists maybe got a little bit lazy, and the audiences stopped coming. The interesting thing for me with all of technology and social media and all that sort of stuff, and yes, I walk out on stage and everybody's got their phone up, but the reality is we've yet to be able to put that feeling of live performance anywhere than in a live performance, right? Uh, when 500 people take a breath in all at the same time, technology doesn't do that. They don't know how to do that. When we're all sweating and breathing and laughing at the same time, at the same joke, in the same moment, with the same music, this is a... Bigger is, than church. It's yep. bigger than church. It's bigger than everything. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what artists have going for them, is our live performances. And we can sell our CDs there. And by the way, my CDs sell like a t-shirt, and uh, you sign them, because artists love that. Um, uh, fans love you to sign their things. But then they take your CD home that they bought, and they download the record. Right. So you've actually sold that record twice. So I think, as an artist, we're in a really great spot right now. I'd like to see Spotify give us more money per play. Mm -hmm. This is where we need to go now, yeah. is to get to get those streaming services, paying the content creators 
uh, a fair wage yep. for their work. Yep. But I think that I think it's there. I think we're there, and and I think that artists now take more control of their careers. I, you can sell CDs off your website. You can sell toenail polish, frisbees. Absolutely. I mean, you can brand and sell some you things stuff. on stage. And I love that you're saying some people got a little lazy and entitled where it's like, hey, I'm a really good musician. You should all be at my show. No, you actually do have to work it a little bit. Yeah, you do. Yeah. You do. And, uh, and I always, when I get this snooty remark from an artist, well, I don't play for the door, I'll simply say, well, I guess you've never played Massey Hall. Mm -hmm. Just like that, yep. sink in there into their little yep. entitled brains. But quite frankly, I'm the artistic director of Kensington Market Jazz Festival, and I only book the people I like, and the people <laughs> I like don't play like that. So we're right, playing. right, and especially <laughs> if someone says I don't play for the door, you go really? Because Robbie Botos just made eight hundred bucks to do an hour, that's right, that's and right. he played for the door. That's right, right. Cash only. Also, you know, you buy a ticket in advance, you might not go. And now that's an empty seat, that that artist has to perform to an empty seat. Right. And it's not only about the money, it's about the vibe in the room. It's about the, it's right. how to, because as an artist, you're only as good as your audience. Yep. You're only as good as that. And you got to know your audience right off the bat. you got you got three bars of music to figure that shit out. Yep. Who's out there tonight? Who am yep. I talking to tonight? I can't believe how many artists don't even think about that. I'm going to give you a very quick uh, okay. uh, uh, figure. A chocolate affair. <laughs> you're 17 years old and you're singing disco. I'm singing Love to Love You Baby as a virgin. <laughs> I'm singing sex songs um, as a little national ballet school virginal little ballerina, actually. Yep. <laughs> and sneaking out of school to sing with that band. So your first band is a disco band. Yes. And then in the 80s, Altamoda, I remember, and Breeding Ground, you were backing singer in Breeding Ground. Yeah. Altamoda, I remember so well. What is your favorite memory of that amazing rock band? Well, you know, we were uh, a band that could play in a straight, straight line because we didn't have an actual drummer on a kit. Our drummer played on electronic pads that he gaffer tape to a piece of fence so we played it a straight line which meant that the Garys and other promoters adored us because you could we open for any band ultimately the best opening act yeah so we built a big story around being able to open for the police open for you too for crying out loud when there were like eight people in the room like that kind of a thing that was Altamoto we also uh, were it was the 80s so it was very much a punk kind of a band but we were kind of the Court jesters and the dance band to the punk scene in Toronto. Right. Circled all the A's in Altamoda. It was a <laughs> joke about high style, high fashion. That's what Altamoda means. Um, I wore a blonde mohawk. <laughs> I shaved my head, I had this crazy mohawk. I wore 1950s bathing suits with Doc Martens. Super cute, by the way. <laughs> yep. Super cute. Um, and I loved the song Julian um, and there's a beautiful little video for Julian that we made with about 10 bucks which goes back to my point of being very creative about making videos when you have no money yep. um, Julian's a beautiful little video and I wrote it about a little boy who's now grown up to actually be a lawyer for Greenpeace. <laughs> wow! I know, I love it. So this is interesting because that video, I remember that video, everybody was spending uh, 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 Eurythmics, Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, oh, yeah. like, like 30, 40,000 oh, pounds oh, yeah. to make a video. Oh, yeah. And then yours was really artistic and sweet. Now this is so many years before YouTube. Now in YouTube you can make a video cheap yeah. and people don't care. Yeah, yeah. But back then to have a video aired on Much Music or no, City TV. Yeah, you had to have some quality. It was quite something to yeah. get to have a low budget and we, video and we aired. Got, we got aired all the time. You sure did. And we loved, we actually in Altamoda, we had a video artist in our band. And he would shoot stuff and we would pre record audio. We would mix that together. And so when we played, you actually saw stuff spin up on the monitors and you heard stuff that we played too. So you might hear a saxophone player and you look up and there is a saxophone player on the monitors. We had to borrow TVs to right. do this to play. Right. So we could never play on Friday nights because everybody watched Dallas. So <laughs> we couldn't get TVs on Friday nights. <laughs> like, you need um, to borrow then, TVs for, the, for your video, right. for your cheap video. And then video. one day somebody gave Norman Ornstein, my music partner of that day, tickets to see you too. And we went to this big U2 show and they had TVs. 
and they had millions and millions of dollars for these TVs right. and all that they they were doing what we had been doing. Yeah, Zoo, Zoo TV. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. They had been we did, but but we we had five bucks. They had five thousand bucks. We had ten bucks. They had ten thousand bucks. Yeah, like it was just crazy. And I remember Norman and I watching this show, going, "Okay, we're done." Like. We're gonna hire a drummer and be a rock band, right? Because clearly, this so is... so you started to move into the infidels, right? And but but let me just say at the same time, Blue Monday and Big Sugar, you were doing jazz on the side in yeah. a kind of a in in, in a very uh, grounding, like it was so authentic. It was really yeah, really great because music. I was living at the Cameron, and I sang downstairs at the Cameron Public House on Queen Street, and what I was doing was learning the standards, learning about the original pop song, Duke Ellington, Billy Strayhorn, right. these guys. It was popular music of popular the day. Music it was of pop. Even though it was jazz, it was pop. See, yeah. for me, the minute you put a singer in a jazz band, it's a pop band. Yeah. So for me, jazz is improvisational, collaborative, there ain't no singers in there. Yeah. So the minute you put a singer in there, we need form. Yeah. We need A, B, A, B, chorus, A, B, A, B, yeah. out. Yeah. With jazz, uh, these guys have that in anywhere. the back of their head, yeah. but it goes anywhere. As Wayne Shorter used to say, you can't rehearse the unknown. I and I live that in that. I so that. much. So I was doing a little jazz thing. I even played at the Imperial Room the next night after Peggy Lee. Like, the Imperial Room marquee actually said, tonight, Peggy Lee, next week, Molly Johnson. Wow! And I was living at the Cameron. So that was the 70s, 80s? That 80s. Was, wow, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. But everyone wanted to push me into singing jazz, and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm learning how to write a great song right now. When I'm older, mm -hmm. and, I can not, sing jazz. and not jumping off of amps and mm -hmm. crowd surfing and all the other mm -hmm. crazy shit I was doing at the time, yeah. um, I'll do that. But in the meantime, I'm sitting in the back room of the Cameron with a fake book and Dave Pilch and Aaron Davis, and we're yep. just going through songs and they're teaching me. And if you want to come watch, great. You want to pay five bucks, even better. But it wasn't a career move, it was a work move. move. You also, with Big, school move. With, with Big Sugar, Gordy Johnson, no relation, <laughs> um, you had, and Terry Wilkins and Al Cross, that was such an amazing time. You had L7 showcases at the Rivoli yeah. where Rebecca Jenkins and Mika Barnes and everybody in the world yeah. would sing at these things. Yeah, and the thing about Gordy J as a guitar player, when I first met Gordy, he was a bass player. And I told him I already had a bass player. He needed to play the guitar. Because what happens is sometimes I get booked in venues with no piano. And I don't want to I don't want to play these old beautiful standards on a piece of electronic bullshit. Right, so right. The, like, I don't want that. So I would turn gigs down if they didn't have a piano. Um, and then when I met Gordy and I told him he needed to play guitar and he came back like, I, I swear to God, it was like a month later and he was playing guitar. <laughs> right, and then it, that's how it became Terry and Gordy. And, uh, and Al, 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 yeah. Al Cross, right? So that was my sort of no piano gig, guys. And I can't even count how many shows, especially oh, at the Rivoli, but a lot and of shows. And then Gordy, it got to the point with Gordy where, so I got him to play guitar instead of bass. And then I got him to sing. And the way I got him to sing was by, it was mostly at Clinton's, the club on call. On, right, on uh, Blur, Blur Street, yeah. Right? And they had the dressing room upstairs. So Gordy and the guys would play a few songs, then they'd play the vamp to bring me on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Molly Johnson, bam, 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 bam. Nothing, crickets. Because I had said to Gordy, I'm not coming down till I hear you sing a song. So he go, he might even do that too. Yeah. Twice, he might go, well, she didn't come. Ladies and gentlemen, Molly Johnson, you do that. Okay, she's not coming. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I'll have to sing a song. That's right, Gordy. And I'd be sitting upstairs having a cigarette, going, that's right, Gordy, we're waiting for you to sing a song. And that's kind of how, Gordy started singing Amazing. and playing guitar. Amazing. Yeah. Well, when I think of how many careers you launched, and, and now we're moving forward to Kumbaya. Yeah. I mean, you launched my career. When I left Look People and I was doing big band music, you gave me the first gig, and it was on Much Music Across the Country yeah. at the Ontario Place Forum. Super exciting times. That was an amazing time. You even suggested that I get Colleen Allen and the Canadian Women with Horns to back right, me up. Right. And then we ended up recording with them on two albums. Right. You yeah. see, that was the beauty of Kumbaya, because I didn't allow... First of all, Kumbaya was an AIDS fundraiser for people living with AIDS in Canada. Camfar did the research piece. We did the Casey houses and the building of hospices and equally important stuff. Both are important, but right? Very separate mm -hmm. identity. Um, so 
we did a 12 hour live music show on Much Music and then flipped over so it was 24 hours live on Much Music so I think what the way that I was able to get artists to collaborate and do stuff was at Ontario Place there was virtually no real dressing rooms backstage it was very big open rooms and everybody kind of had to hang out right so really famous people had to hang out with up and coming people and I wouldn't (laughs) allow record companies or managers backstage Backstage. yep only performers because they would have stopped Mary Margaret for singing with Blue Rodeo for the first time Rock uh, Andy Jam- Kim, Andy Kim with the Bare Naked Ladies for Andy, the first time. We right. brought Andy King up, Kim up. Yeah, we invited him from LA. Yep. he came, and he still lives here now. Yes, he does. <laughs> yeah, I brought him here. <laughs> he forgets that, but I brought him here. Yep. and uh, introduced him to Bare Naked Ladies backstage. Like these things were happening backstage. Yep, during the day, we needed a guitar. What something was wrong with our guitar? Danny Lenoir. That was the second year. Danny Lenoir gave us his guitar to play. There you go. Who does that? Well, Canadians do when they're left to their own devices in a room without business people. Mm-hmm. And it's just artists. It's yep. quite phenomenal what happens. Yep. And we just let that happen. And we, Denise Stalin and I, who was running much at the time, we would kind of configure things. Mm-hmm. Right? And it was a lot of fun. Um, and we raised millions and millions and millions of dollars. Like over and a million on the first year alone. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we continue to raise money in a weird sort of way and that people leave... Kumbaya in their wills. Yep. So out of nowhere, I'll go to the post office box and there'll be a check for 10 grand. Mm-hmm. Or there'll be a check for this. And what does Molly do with that money now? Will I take it to Holt Renfrew and I spend it? No. <laughs> I walk down the street to Stephen Lewis, <laughs> the Stephen Lewis Foundation on Spadina, and just hand the checks to him. I say, here yep. you go. Go do something with that. Yep. Amazing. <laughs> um, you sang background in, in uh, backing vocals in Breeding Ground. Yes, I did, amongst many other bands. Uh, but yes, I did. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking uh, maybe Happy for Now I Know was the name of the song, right. the Breeding Ground, the big one. And it was, again, on Much Music and on yeah. the radio a lot. Um, uh, there was one other, I think it was maybe White Noise, Bill Grove. Maybe did you sing with them for a little I bit? Did. Yeah, Bill, Bill was one of the early, early guys to get me singing jazz. He was real jazz. That he dude really, was, really was far out. He was really cool with me. And it was between him and Moses Neimer, actually, the two of them, that they had a booze camp. And uh, I would sing at it. Wow. And you sang back up to my, my first jazz record, but it was a song called Groovy Movie. And you jokingly said, look, I know we're friends, but you could just hire some cheerleaders to sing this. It was oh not God, a difficult I'm sorry. song. I'm sorry. No. So the next time I recorded the album, I went to a strip bar and I invited some girls to leave the office oh, and come in and sing on the, on the remix of it. Because I just thought sing. anyone would could sing People this song. People love to sing, but, but I, I, I sang back up for Celine Dion, for... Jeff Healy, of course, Tom Cochran, Life is a Highway, mm-hmm. that big piece of business. Uh, uh, Babar the movie. Yeah. Uh, the best we both can be. <laughs> yes, how and old, I... How old were you in your 20s? Or yeah, I something? was. Yeah. And then later, I was hired as a voice character for Babar, and I played... Um, oh, she was a sneaky cougar. She was a cougar. Wow, yeah. you you have done c- cartoons. You do a lot of of jingles that no one would know it's you. Like in a way, I kind yeah. of know it's you, yeah. but I'm not sure. It could be a car company or something. Yeah, I t- uh, my rule with commercial work has always been, I'll talk about a hamburger, but I won't sing about a hamburger. Yep, singing is separate. Um, and you want to want you're gonna you have to like the song or like the jingle yeah, or like I think the product. I've done it yeah. three times in 25 years have I sung on a commercial. Right. All the rest of it is it's talking. Voiceover, yeah. I love the challenge of that because you take all the skills as a singer, which words to emote on, timing, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, right? All those little tools we have in our tool belt as singers, I get to bring it to a voice situation. And the beauty of voice work is it, we call it pajama work. Because you can, you know, you, you can basically wear pajamas because nobody sees you. Well, this, and this is the thing you've done with your life. Uh, I, there's a very few singers. I could mention maybe Barbara Lika uh, talks the way she sings. Like yeah. you can see that it's going to come out of her mouth. Yeah. With you, you talk the way you sing. You, it, it's just you. It's yeah. you don't put anything on. Yeah. So people will say you sound a little bit like Billie Holiday. Yes, but it's because it's you. You're yeah. not actually yeah. mimicking or doing no, anything. No, I don't mimic. I don't yeah. listen to other singers, so I don't have anything. It's a rule, really. I don't really. Want to hear about you so I, I don't really listen you know I remember Heather Bambrick freaking out when I said that because her whole she's the exact opposite 
is she deeply, deeply listens to singers and has become a great singer. I deeply, deeply don't listen to singers. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Surviving. Yeah, yeah. You have you put your stamp on something. Yeah. And and I guess I could also say the Molly Holly syndrome of Canada. Oh, yes. You both put your stamp on any song you do. Oh, you mean Holly Johnson and Molly <laughs> Brown? <laughs> Molly Brown. Oh, my God. Uh, I, I, Holly Cole was my roommate for a while, and I could <laughs> never... Oh, my God, that must have been fun. Yeah, and her oh, brother yeah. Alan, the three of us oh shared a house. Oh, my God. It was insanely Super fun. Super fun. Uh, and she is as down-to-earth as anyone could ever be. Right. Um, and like you, she... If she says sings girl talk, it's girl. There's an R in girl talk. It's not girl talk. She it she's, well, she's herself from the East Coast. So both of you though have made a living, and you were the ones the real groundbreakers. Like the two of you were the first, but way before Diana Krall, that got out to across the country. Right. Everyone was playing your music. Everyone well, knew who you guys were. Well, Diana, you know she didn't sing till much later, and you know her trajectory was so fast that she didn't actually get to have community the way Holly and I have and build friendships the way Holly and I have in Canada. She's kind of foreign yep. in a way, and I know she feels that and and certainly wouldn't trade what she's got, but I do yeah. know that going like that. You're right, she went from a great piano player on Just In Time Records yeah. to world famous That's pretty right. quickly. That's right, yeah. That's right. So what is your favorite thing about your, 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 your current path? I mean, between running the festival, being nominated for a brand new record that isn't technically a jazz record, although jazz people love it and it's yeah, still right. being played everywhere. <laughs> um, um, what is your favorite thing right now in your trajectory? What is something that you want to do that you haven't done yet? I haven't done yet. Ooh, uh, get my kid through high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of them. I got one through. <laughs> That's a big thing for me right now. You know, I got to say, um, my kids and my family have always uh, been first. And I surround myself with a band that has similar... And is like family anyway. It's yeah. like family. Like uh, 25 years with Mike Downs, 20 years with Robbie Botash, 27 years with David A. Dorenzo. So basically, Robbie got off the plane and you scooped him up. In a way, I yeah. did. He was playing at, at uh, the Montreal Bistro with Lauter. Luther. Uh, Luther. 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 Remember? And uh, Doug Riley had been my piano player. Yeah. Doug the music. late, great Doug my Riley. Darling what Doug. a sweet man he my was. My darling Doug. And uh, Doug passed away very suddenly. And I. it took me years to find somebody to, to sit in that chair. Yeah. And Roddy. As a music director, Doug Riley was the most easygoing guy. No stress. Stress just fell off of him. He just smiled and made Big everything smoker. okay. <laughs> yep. Big yep. Smoker. Yep. He was so chill. Yeah. Unbelievable yeah. music director. Yeah. yeah. I love Doug. And uh, I, I sang on one of Doug's commercials because Doug asked me to sing on one of his commercials. So, you know, I did sing on commercials. But Doug was extremely special and a dear friend and recognized something in me that I didn't even know I had and brought it out and supported yeah. it, the voice and all kinds of stuff and then to lose him like that, um, it was tough. Right. And there's lots of great piano players around but you're kind of spoiled. When you, when in this city. With Doug yeah. Riley. yeah, yeah. And to find someone with his temperament, that's the hard part. Right. Finding great players, no problem in yeah, Toronto. Yeah, they're around but, yeah. but there's so much more to it than being a great player. And yeah. Robbie... Uh, I, I came into the uh, Montreal Bistro and he was playing with Billy Newton Davis and Billy had said to me now Molly this is a jazz gig I'm going to play it real straight I'm going to give it the jazz it's going to be straight none of this crazy oh my god stuff. Billy Newton Davis singing Duke Ellington is heavenly I gotta say though <laughs> within the second song yeah second song yeah. shirt off on the tables, moving his shirt around, <laughs> everybody dancing. Lothar, yeah. who ran the quietest jazz club, right. was standing beside me going, what's happening here? Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> I, I now run a disco. <laughs> That's and right. A jazz club. A he disco. totally let her rip. And, but I watched Robbie, and I, who the hell is that guy? Who's keeping up with all this funk stuff? Right. Right. More than See? just a jazz player. He's See? a musician. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah, and I don't, I don't really... It's not about the jazz for mm -hmm. me. I'm not. I didn't go to school for jazz. I didn't yeah. learn jazz. I came to jazz. I don't. I'm not a jazz person, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. So I needed somebody who could do all kinds of stuff. Yep. And 
there's the guy. There he is right there playing with Billy Newton Davis at the Montreal Bistro. That is amazing. And he had only been here a while. He'd only been here a while. And, and of course, uh, I'm so glad that you get Davide Dorenzo because, he, I mean, Cassandra Wilson, Nora Jones, everybody wants him. Anyone who ever sees him play goes, uh, could I just take you on tour, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the beauty of Davide is he's, he's not just a drummer. That's one of many instruments. He's a, a musician, but he's a singer's musician. He's a singer's drummer. Because when you look back at Davide while you're doing a gig, he's singing along. Right. He knows all the words, right. so he plays accordingly. A, a melodic drummer. Yeah, yeah, and he's breathing with you. Yeah. This is key. Yeah. You know, I'm in take, he's in take. Like we're, he, it's like that. Yep, and he finds what's not there and gives it a little something. That's right. Not, and it's not often driving. he doesn't play at all. Yep, yep. You know, like I've, it's quite hilarious. <laughs> it's that. pretty amazing. He takes his hands right off the damn drum. Kit. And that is really mature. That's not oh, yeah. something that young drummers oh, yeah. usually no, have. No, 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 no. And 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 his, you know, do I have subs? Yeah, Larno Lewis. Give me a break. <laughs> um, uh, and then I, I've been, I've had this very young kid on a couple of my shows uh, named Warrell. Worrell, and he's a young Humber kid, and a student of Larnell's, and a student of Mark Kelso's, mm -hmm. and uh, I threw this kid to the Lions, uh, had him open, for, we were opening for Gregory Porter at the Winter Elgin, whatever, yeah, and, uh, you yeah. know, 1,500 people, and uh, he so impressed me, this kid, by getting to the gig, downtown Toronto, from whatever suburb, Burlington, Brampton, yeah. I don't know, one of those places, yeah. on the bus, yeah. in his new suit, with his little snares and his little sticks. Mm -hmm. He'd never had a drum roadie. So it was like, somebody setting my kit up side stage. Yeah, this is your kit, mm -hmm. side stage, sit down on it, make sure it's where you want it, and then those guys will move it exactly how you want it on stage. He's like looking at me like, what mm -hmm. are you saying to me? Right, what language is that? <laughs> what language is that? <laughs> where am I? He's so adorable, brought mm -hmm. his mom. Um, but that's a kid that I actually think has a future in the music business because he, at rehearsal he was, he, he'd done his homework, mm -hmm. he was ready for rehearsal, and by the way, he's in a band now with two of his teachers, and one of them's the head of the music department. Right on. So, he's done his homework, he's on time for rehearsals, he's adorable, he's very good looking, and he's on time. Yeah, yeah. I said, you know what, this kid might actually get something going. That's probably some good advice you could give young uh, musicians is like that whole thing about being dependable is as important as being a good musician. Oh, yeah. As You're not going to keep getting you, gigs, right? Like, like my thing is, you know, well, I've played with the same guys forever and if I can't get those guys, I tend to not do the gig. That's the way I roll. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll not do it if I can't get them because it's not fun. Right. I, it's not fun and I don't really like singing that much so you know <laughs> you've said this many times many times you, you enjoy it when it's with your family when you're on stage and that's you're right. all supporting each other that's right but it's not a calling that you need no, to get exactly. out there and sing and have no, them love you I, that's no, not I a not it's not a Liza Minnelli uh, gypsy thing gotta <laughs> sing gotta dance no. <laughs> no it's not me I don't gotta sing and I certainly don't gotta dance <laughs> <laughs> you, you when you first started and I love this story Ed Mervish kicked off your career in Porgy and Bess. He did. You were a little kid. I was a little kid. I was a little tiny kid. My, my brother and sister, we were all little, and uh, we'd done a little bit of TV with CBC only because there were so few black kids in the city in the 70s, in the 60s. Yep. This is like 1964. Right. Very few folks of color in the, in the city. Yep. Um, and we lived across the street. This is key mm -hmm. to Judith Lawrence. Who was the puppeteer on Mr. Mr. Dressa? Dress Casey and Finnegan, yeah, boy or girl, yep, and that was on purpose. Judith Lawrence wanted to make Judith a puppet. Was a gen genius, and and thank way you, before anyone ever did this. Lauren Michaels, you never the knew. The Canadian kid who grew up watching Mr. Dressa. Yep, Lauren Michaels, who did Pat on right. Saturday Night Live. Live. Yep, Pat was actually Casey. Casey. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And Judith Lawrence, uh, now out in Vancouver. She died. She oh, she did pass away? She, did. she was around when I, I threw a party for Mr. Dress Up for his retirement party. That's right. You were a friend of Ernie's as yep, well. Yeah, a big friend that. of Ernie Coombs. And, and she was so nice. She sent a letter. She said, you know, Casey lives out here with me. <laughs> Unfortunately, he can't be there. <laughs> and he's like, but as a kid, I, no one knew. Casey, we were pretty sure it was a boy, but they never... It's the greatest question. It's like yeah. asking who's your favorite Beatle, and it sort of tells you the kind of person they are. Right. It's if you say Casey and Finnegan, Casey, boy or girl. 
girl and get the this kind of is a yeah. similar question. Yeah, that was amazing. And so Judith Lawrence that, went across from yeah, you. Yeah, and she had they had the tickle trunk and they were lesbians, which in 1964 was. Oh. Yep. And of course, my mother, the hippie, was like pushing us out the door to go over there. Yep. None of the other kids were really allowed to go over there and play because they were CBC people, and she's a lesbian. Yeah. But we were kicked out the door there, so there was that, which got us into CBC, which sort of went into a bit of Beachcomber, King of Kenzie, you know. It's yeah. like, we need a Portuguese kid, get those Johnson kids. We need a Chinese kid, get those Johnson kids. Like, seriously, yeah. we were just working. Yeah, because we were. So that's Tabby Johnson, your big sister. That's right. And Clark Johnson. And Clark. He certainly got on to do yes. a whole bunch of stuff. He sure did. So the three of you were all doing kid parts in all different types Bits of things. Bits and pieces yeah. of acting, you know. Yeah. And and for my mother, who was at that point now in law school and very busy, uh, like it was like summer camp. Please take my children, and go sit on that set for two days or three days. She's not a stage mother at all. At all, no. In fact, she put at, us in a cab. In fact, tell us a little bit about some of her clients as a lawyer, oh, because her life clients, story is quite clients. something. Fidel Castro was a client of my mother's. She helped with Jimmy Carter. They brought Canadian Save the Children, that kind of think tank, to Cuba to help Fidel change the literacy rate around. In Which Cuba. was done in about eight years. Eight, the, right. the, entire the entire country became, became literate, literate in eight in years. Eight years yeah. um, and and I was just came back from Cuba, and that was a major point that they talked about, and that can Canada always stood by yes. Cuba well, at all Fidel times. Well, Fidel was the pallbearer at Pierre Elliott Trudeau's funeral. Look at the pictures. Right. Google it, people. Yeah. You'll see Fidel, and you'll see our Prime Minister, little Justin, yeah. sitting there. You, you, like, it's all there. Yeah. Like, I can't believe people question Justin Trudeau. The guy, like, he's been there. Yeah. Reluctantly been there, by the way. Right. And didn't die to be the prime minister. He got <laughs> bullied and begged into it. Yeah. And took it on. Yeah. After being a school teacher and other things. Camp right. counselor. <laughs> garbage collector, whatever that was. Absolutely. Else. Right? Yeah, absolutely so, amazing what happened. And you actually spent time in Cuba as a kid. I did. And your brother actually, like, hung out with Fidel. Yeah, we got pictures of my brother playing basketball with Fidel. Because what Fidel did was he took some of the big mansions and turned them into schools. And, and brought people from the country in to live there and learn to read. And he paved their front lawns and put up basketball courts. <laughs> Crazy. Because he loved basketball. He also loved Che. Dr. Guevara. Mm -hmm. Che Guevara. Doctor. Mm -hmm. People forget that. Americans want us to think they, that they were these guys that just came out of the hills out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Fidel was a lawyer. Right. He was a freaking lawyer, mm -hmm. and Shea was a doctor. Yeah. So you break an arm in any island in the West Indies, please be Cuba, because mm -hmm. they have the best medical in the on the islands. Yeah. Because that was Fidel's goal to, in homage to his dear friend, he's going to make medicine incredible there, and Fidel also wanted culture. He wanted to prove to the world that. They had the best ballet company in the world, which they ended up with Alicia Alfonso, where I got to take lessons as a child. Who's was in her 90s or something? She's in yeah. her I think Amazing. she's 100 or something yeah. now. Ridiculous. <laughs> Ballerinas don't die. They're a bit like jazz musicians. They just <laughs> into dust. Yeah. <laughs> pile of dust <laughs> when they're finished. <laughs> So your mom was a lawyer to some amazing people. Yes, that was. one especially and is just crazy. And a real activist. And, you know, like, right from marrying a black man in 1948 or 49 or whatever. Right, because your mom's did. white, your dad was black. That's yeah. right, in the United States of America, where it was illegal in most states for them to be married. Um, doing that, uh, walking away from extreme privilege. Extreme. Like, I don't want to bore you people with the details. Yeah. But, she went to school with Jackie Onassis. I'm talking extreme privilege. Mm -hmm. And walked away from the whole nine yards. Never really heard about it. She walked away happily. And walked into an all-black family in Philadelphia ghetto where she'd never washed a dish or, or done a diaper or anything with a new baby. Wow. Oh, Mercifully for her, my father was the oldest. So he knew how to cook. He knew how to diaper babies. Yeah. He knew all that stuff. Yeah. So... Amazing! Match what in heaven. <laughs> so, so there's, so there's Porgy and Bess, and then South Pacific and Finian's Rainbow. Ed yeah. Mervish put you in a whole bunch of stuff. He did. And Finian's Rainbow, I guess, would have been maybe your first Don Frank sighting. It was my first Don <laughs> Frank sighting, and um, I adored him and Lily. And uh, my sister was very close with Don too because uh, they went on to the hair, the world of hair, and 
all that kind of stuff. Now, Hair, I don't know, was it was the actual debut here or was it in New York? Because it's as famous here as Broadway. I think it was in New York. Yeah. I think it was New York, and I think, but it was Ed that had the balls to bring to it here. To bring it here, right. And, 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 and opening with a nude scene, for example. That's right. Yeah. And Finian's Rainbow was a play about racism, and Porgy and Bess, of course, was a play about racism. Yeah. And for that matter, so was South Pacific. Right. So Ed already had a history of bringing challenging pieces to a very white, conservative uh, city, yep. right? So this was not... And how much did you love Ed Mervish? Like, Ed. what a spirit. Yeah, oh, my. my gosh. He gave me my only real singing lesson, where he... <laughs> I must have been six. And you have to understand that I'm not an... At, at six years old, five years old, you really just went up from a potted plant on stage, right? <laughs> yep. You're really there just to be cute and stand around and somebody's always side stage to bring you on and push you back out and bring you on and you just have to keep your eye on that person and that person would make you know assistant director pull you in and pull you out like it, so so it wasn't rocket science it, it never helped when i fell into the orchestra pit of which i did a couple of times really? yes, I did. oh my god but ed in a rehearsal once i remember him standing at the back of the royal alex and saying to me on stage um just talk to me Always talk to the cheap seats. We're the ones that are listening. Wow, that's a really good quote. Right? Yeah. And he was right about that. Of course he was. Yeah? He also told me when they say your name and they introduce you, always give it a beat. Give it a couple of beats. Make them wait. Make them wait. Make them wait. Yeah. And always, always leave them wanting more. Don't overstay your welcome. Yeah. Those two bits of advice came way later when I was singing jazz at the Senator. Mm -hmm. He came to see me there. Because what had happened was I was a theater brat and I was going to the National Ballet and he was supporting our family with ballet shoes for me and helping me stay in that school. And then I left after I'd run my, my course at that school, right up to the corps de ballet, like I, I went as far as you could actually go. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to be was a choreographer. I wanted to make stuff. Right. I loved the tutus, I loved all that stuff, but I, I didn't You didn't create. need to be principal dancer, you wanted no, to no, be no. showing people no, no, what to no. do. No, 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 when you go to school with Karen Kane, yeah. um, you very quickly, unless you're an idiot, know who the prima ballerina is. <laughs> right. And quite frankly, adore her. Yeah. Like, oh my God, look what she's done to the National Ballet. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm not surprised mm -hmm. that she built that school out from three little buildings on Maitland to the magnificence. The beautiful, of what marvel it is, of right? architecture. And the way that she's Jarvis, yeah. changed the color of the ballet, never mind the buildings in the ballet. She and the Queen's Key and Jarvis, right? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you come off the highway, you can look in and see them making the wardrobe. Yeah. It's right there. But also the color of the ballet. She's very, she knows that will never be Alvin Ailey, but, but we need the, the National Ballet of Canada needs to reflect Canada. Yeah. So she works very hard to get people of color into her company. I know you may mm -hmm. say, I went to the ballet, I only saw one person, yeah. trust me. <laughs> that one person, yeah. she worked hard for that person. That's right. She brought one of her dancers, she went all the way to South Africa for an African boy uh, mm -hmm. from South Africa. Yeah. So I adore Karen. Yeah. And to go to that school and to have the benefit of that education. I didn't need a singing class. I know exactly where every single piece of my body is. I know where <laughs> it needs to be to make that sound. Yeah. I don't need anything. That's what you need. And I, I'm lucky to have that. But Ed, I left the ballet, and he stopped talking to me. And he stopped talking to me for years. Mm -hmm. Like years, all through this chocolate affair and all this stuff. Right. He's not talking. Oh my God! You were a ballerina. Now you're doing disco. Yeah. Yeah. And At seventeen. Funk and yeah. what's this stuff? And why mm -hmm. is your hair like that? Um, basically, lost touch with him. Yeah. Uh, and fast forward to me then playing at the iconic Senator. So it's like uh, late eighties now. Late eighties. Yep. And I was doing a night, a couple of nights there with Doug Riley, and Sybil Walker. My beloved Sybil Walker, who is the heart and soul of the jazz community. I don't care what anybody says. Yep. Everybody else needs to, you know, Absolutely. go away. Yep. Because she's actually the one who's been there from the beginning of time since she lived at Rochdale with my dad, not in the same apartment, but... <laughs> right. The right. Rochdale days. The Rochdale days. You should get Sybil on the show. Anyhow, I know. Absolutely. And just Rochdale. Let's yeah, just go over that Rochdale. for an hour. Let's just talk about Rochdale. Um, but Sybil came up to me on a break and said... Uh, somebody wants to talk to you in the back of the senator. I'm, lo I'm looking at her. Because she's not saying who. But I can tell 
that whoever it is, I need to go talk to them. Yeah. I can just tell by her voice. Yeah. This is not a You fan. need to go there now. This yeah. is not just some unknown person. Mm-hmm. And I walk back there, and there was Sam Snyderman and Ed Mervis. Yep. <laughs> and Eddie looked at me up and said, okay, I get it. I get what you're doing. I get it. Mm-hmm. I get it. Yep. And you since you were four years old. Yep. You're now 22. 20, and you're singing some jazz at the. And you've got uh, a great band, and yep. I get it. Awesome. So. And then her, her, now, of course, his son David has David. honestly picked up the mantle. Oh my God! That must it's, not have been an easy thing in life. No, it, to he's have a to, shy, bookish, thoughtful, loves architecture and art, and yep. would have been happy on Markham Street with his little bookstore, yep. selling books on art and architecture. <laughs> right. And and he has had to, and he's done a great job. Oh, right up to putting the red boots on for Kinky Boots. Come on. I, that was a pretty adorable When photo. I saw that the first day on television, I had to phone him. Yeah. I had to phone him and go, yep. David, how did they get you in those boots? How? He said, well, I saw them lying there, and they look so great, I just tried them on. Now, you seem like a person who doesn't care about accolades, but... Having Juno Awards and things like that, all kinds of awards, but the Order of Canada must have been, 2007, must have been something a little bit surreal for you. It was. Right? It was beautiful. And it's, it, it's, it's about what you've done for music. It's about what you did with Kumbaya. It's about yeah. what you've done. And, and this was before Kensington Market Jazz mm-hmm. Festival, but your, your amount of, I mean, patron, philanthropy, there, there's a whole bunch of different ways of putting this. Yeah. What did you think you were there for? Like, what what was... I was very confused that day because, uh, well, I was the youngest person in the room for sure. There's no doubt about that. And my dear friend June Callwood, the activist and real philanthropist and real activist, yeah. who was the burn behind Kumbaya, who was the burn behind actually building Casey House and starting the first women's feminist group in Canada called The Voice of Women and an old friend of my mom's. And I got to work with her on Kumbaya. And she got cancer and she was dying. And, uh, I think it was Junie that made sure I got that pen before she died so that it would keep me going. And inspire other people. That's right. Women, men, any age yeah. would inspire people to yeah. go. Wow, this isn't about just music here. No, no. This is in about. In fact, mine wasn't about music at all. No, it's about involvement, community yeah, engagement, it was about and community engagement for yeah. sure, and and conversations around AIDS. Because, I mean, when we did Kumbaya the first year, um, people wouldn't touch you if you had AIDS. Right. People, doctors. People, people didn't know anything. Nothing. Yeah. And I had an inkling, again, be, all roads lead to my mom, and then there are a few that lead to my dad. Mm-hmm. But my mom spending so much time in Africa uh, with CUSO, uh, which she started, Canadian University Service Overseas. Yes, that's well, I didn't know mom. she started that. Oh, yeah, she did. She wow. was one of the founders, definitely one of the first in. A um, lot of time in Africa, my mom. Again, good thing my dad could cook. Yeah. Uh, she was a terrible cook anyhow, it was fine. See you, Mom. <laughs> we'll see you in six weeks. We'll be fine. Seriously. Mm-hmm. Go do big things. Mm-hmm. We'll have hot dogs. Yeah. Um she uh I, I'm losing my train of thought. Oh, just just that, that African thing with well, uh, she, you right, she knowing a little more about you, AIDS than other that's people. That's right. She would come back from Africa saying there's a disease over there. It's called they're calling it the slimming disease. It's killing people. So I knew a long time ago that AIDS wasn't a gay disease. I right. knew that as a, as a young adult, as yep. a young, young adult, I knew that AIDS was not a gay disease. And when it hit North America, it hit the gay community hard. And it was branded as a gay disease. Right. And that was number one misconception that needed to end. At the time, I was in the Infidels, a rock band, and we were playing a lot of universities, i.e. a lot of drunken, privileged university students. Right. Very annoying. The guys who beat me up in high school. Yeah, yeah those guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I got to thinking, you know, they're not really getting the message of AIDS because it's being branded as a gay disease. And lots of kids are thinking, I'm not a gay hairdresser doing intravenous drugs, so therefore I'm not at risk. Not realizing that it's a sexually transmitted disease. Right. And you're having a lot of sex. I, you're having it right now. And a lot of unprotected sex. Mostly. Yeah. So I felt like I had to deliver the bad news. Somebody had to deliver the bad news to these kids mm-hmm. that for the first time in the history of mankind, 
the thing you love to do the most, other than eating, it may kill you. Right. Sorry, I have to deliver that news. Yeah. And, but I felt it was really important. And nobody was talking to kids. Nobody. Right. And I had to fight a lot of gay folks because there was a lot of, it's our disease. Mm -hmm. Rightly so. Mm -hmm. They were dying first and foremost. Yeah. And, and gathered the wagons, circled the wagons. But I had to come in guns a-blazing and go, guys, this mentality is going to kill everybody. Right. Because this is not your disease. Right. This is our disease. Yep. And we need to deal with this. And that was a huge fight the first year of Kumbaya. Yeah. And every year, Molly, you don't have enough gay acts. Am I supposed mm -hmm. to ask people, Tom Cochran, are you gay? Mm -hmm. Getty Lee, what's happening? Yeah. No, I'm not doing that. Right. I'm not doing that. Yeah. So I did it different ways. Mm -hmm. um, lots of different ways. But uh, I love doing stuff like that. I, I, I remember talking to Peter Zosky many years ago and Peter saying, well, so what you're saying, Molly, is when you grow up, you want to be a philanthropist. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, philanthropists are rich. <laughs> he said, <laughs> right. I know, I, 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 I don't think I'm going to be able to work that one out. Haven't but, worked on that part <laughs> I yet. That out yet. And by the way, I still haven't worked that out. But I, I really loved, I, the fame thing is, uh, like most Canadians, we're, we, don't like, we don't like fame. Yeah. Really, it's a thing. We don't. You know, when David Mervish uh, uh, was asked about uh, doing big budget musicals, because he lost money on one of them, right. and he said, you could do something or you can do nothing. That's right. We're going to do something. That's right. You are not going to wait for your ship to come in to no. start helping people. No. You do it on a daily basis because yeah. it's you. It's me. Yeah. And, and I don't even think of it as helping people. I just think of it as, well, this shit needs to get done. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Well, it looks like it's going to be me. <laughs> Same with the jazz festival. You know, it's like, man... Nobody locally likes the jazz festival that happens here. And if Molly Johnson is getting the shit kicked out of her, yeah. I can only imagine what all my colleagues... Well, you were the first... You were the first... Uh, this wasn't that long ago, but you were the first headlining female to sell out the main stage. Yeah, and then they didn't book me again for five years. Right. So, and then when they did, they split the bill with me and Jane Burnett. Right, as if you couldn't have filled the room, right. And Jane could have filled the room, too, individually. You didn't need to do a, a, a double that. army. It's just not. So, so you went out and started your own festival that's all about cash, all about supporting music, all about being live, and it's coming up yet again. Fourth year. And also the second week of the film festival, so you're getting people that are here from out of town that are just oh, ready yeah. to go we take told, a look. I, you know, you could, you got to pick a weekend in Toronto. And every weekend in Toronto is booked. This there's is, a festival every single oh, weekend. Something. Absolutely. This is a fabulous town. Even David Mervish walks back and forth backstage every night as to whether he's going to fill a house or not. Because right. Toronto is known for walk-up. Because we wake up in the morning with 15 choices. Right. We are spoiled here. We are spoiled yep. and entitled and privileged. Mm -hmm. And it's fabulous. <laughs> um, so, you know, I... I back to cash only... One of the things the artists love about our festival and what is a consistent comment is engagement of audience. That the audience is so engaged. And I totally believe that because they paid their cash, they really want to be there. Right. So they're already 50% our audience because they really wanted to be there. They didn't, oh, let's buy a few tickets to this and oh, something else is this weekend and we're not going. No, you want to you wanna be there, you got to pay. You yep. got to pay right now. And there's ATMs all over the market. And the cash goes right to the artist from our beloved volunteers who collect it yep. and give it to the artist. And even Rev Canada, who called me after the second year, asking me, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I said to the lady, well, one thing I'm not doing is I'm not touching money. Mm -hmm. I don't touch any money. I don't touch money. Uh, she's like, well, how do you, what do you do? And I said, well, the audience pays the artist. Yeah. So it's up to the artist to claim yep. income, not me. Yeah. You and, don't touch and, it. and the Revenue Canada people said, well, it's kind of like tips with a waiter. I said, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's up to them as to how much they, yep. they do or don't do. Yep. Amazing. Well, I love your festival. And we I love, love you. And, I and love thank you, you for meeting me here in Barbarians. I love Barbarians. 1959. Some well, things never change. I was born in 1959. And I have been coming here since I was a very small child. And uh, with Ed Mervish. <laughs> And even I've had lunch here with Sam Snyderman. Um, 
And I love Aaron. And he's a lot like David Mervish. Right, taking over Harry, taking over his dad's business, right. and really making it happen That's and right. keeping it, keeping it the way he would have wanted. You yeah. know, at a certain point in your life, and if this could be a message that I leave for everybody today, at a certain point in your life, it's about mentorship. And if we don't reach out to the generation and give them a leg up, we might as well forget all the work we've done. Right. Because it's all about carrying it forward, and we need to pull people with us, young people with us and give them the tools and give them a safe space pace to, to, to work yep. and uh, see where it goes. Yep. But it's all about mentorship. Well, thank you. Thank you, baby. Oh, I love you. <laughs> that was fine. Wow! Molly Johnson, wasn't she something? Amazing woman. Um, I have a lot of special guests coming up in the next while. Colin Hunter, the great crooner. Uh, Jane Eastwood, the great actor. More and more stuff coming up. If you want to support this, Patreon! That's how you can do it. Uh, you can also just give me comments at jamesb.ca. I would love to hear from you. I would love your support. Um, doing this isn't cheap or easy, but I am. Okay, so that's enough. Uh, we're coming back next week. Thank you so much for watching. And next Friday, a week of listings, a special guest. It'll be Colin Hunter talking about singing, flying around the world, owning jazz clubs, and other stuff. You've got to come back. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Bye.